So I want to offer just some brief comments on the first couple of chapters of Isabel Stengers' book, Making Sense in Common, uh, a reading of Whitehead in Times of Collapse. Now, this is Stengers' second book on Whitehead. Her first was titled Thinking with Whitehead, a free and wild creation of concepts, and that was published in French in 2002 and then in English in 2011. And that was a huge text, really going into the nuts and bolts of Whitehead's philosophy, showing its its relevance across a number of different domains, the philosophy of science, metaphysics proper, and uh, dealing with issues um, navigating between science, scientific knowledge, and uh, politics. Now in this book, Making Sense in Common, Stengers is really focused on the social and political implications of scientific knowledge and how we navigate uh, what nowadays is called this post-truth era. Um, we've entered a stage where facts themselves are up for grabs uh, and different polities, different sectors of society, uh, different institutions have uh, apparently their own set of facts or interpretation of the facts or alternative uh, facts, as it is said. Uh, now, in this situation, Stengers is trying to argue that Whitehead's philosophy and his cosmology is actually quite relevant, um, not just to this issue of being post-truth or post-fact, uh, but really to the broader planetary emergency within which this issue around facts is one symptom. So she's looking at... Uh, She's, she's attempting to reconstitute a kind of common sense, right? When for much of the modern period, science and scientists have set about um, embarrassing common sense, um, putting it in its place, contradicting it uh, with a kind of zeal uh, in favor of a, of a sort of knowledge of nature that would be uh, disinterested, right? That would be objective, and universal and necessary. So you have this growing body of experts uh, who are telling the common people that this is how it is. Um, these are the facts. We, in a sense, are smarter than you, and so you better listen to us. Now, um, Stengers looks at this history and says, in some sense, the humiliation of the common people at the hands of so-called experts has led to a reaction, uh, reactionary politics, populist politics. People don't want to be told what to do by experts, not only because they feel uh, humiliated, but because there's also plenty of instances of expert knowledge derived from uh, laboratory experiments and specialized abstractions that when applied outside the lab in the real world, uh, where there's you know lots of confounding factors and variables, uh, turns out that what was a fact in the laboratory is not a fact um, in the wild. And so whether it's with uh, GMOs or various other sort of techno-scientific uh, interventions, um, the, the people uh, have risen up against the imposition of a certain kind of technical or techno-scientific knowledge. And Stengers wants to dig in here not to um, demonize one side or the other, not to choose sides, not to say these are the good guys and those are the bad guys, but to find a new way of making sense in common, to find a new way of establishing something like a fact through a kind of deliberative exercise together. Um, she'll call this a generative um, apparatus where we can talk with each other as citizens and do a kind of deliberative, direct uh, democracy that would allow us to sort of do science in a more public way and avoid this, um, this bifurcation between uh, scientific experts, experts on the one hand who just hand down knowledge to us as people, uh, but instead people with a whole you know, diversity of life experiences, concrete practical experiences can enter into dialogue with scientists and, you know, try to find the things that their facts, as established in, in laboratories, isolated from the real world, um, leave out. So she's seeking a kind of diplomatic 
method, right? And she wants to avoid allowing either side or any side to declare victory or uh, to declare victimhood. She really wants to make room for uh, as many views as possible while also acknowledging the importance and the validity of, of the scientific method and scientific operations. She just wants to put the results of scientific practice in, in proper context, right? And not allow the myth of the isolated fact uh, to become this domineering force imposed on society and on non-human nature. Uh, and she's really also looking at the agency of non-human beings in, in the scientific uh, process. Often, you know, the way modern science has been construed is that nature is just a collection of objects out there passively uh, waiting to be known, right? Just neutral stuff waiting for scientists to establish laws um, determining its behavior. When in fact, nature is composed of other living beings in the case of our biosphere. And if we take Whitehead seriously, there's a kind of, of life, at least the germ of life, and some value and experiential vibrancy present all the way down, uh, even into the what we could call the pre-living, um, pre-biological world of, of, uh, of atoms and, and molecules and so on. So Stengers wants to bring non-human beings back into this practice of science and, you know, Whitehead's concept of societies of actual entities becomes relevant here. For Whitehead, society isn't just a word we use to talk about large groups of human beings, but is a term that he generalizes to refer to, uh, groups of entities at every scale in nature and the kind of communal order and, and habit that these groups of entities can establish together. And when you get enough of these entities um, engaging in sort of the construction of social habits, you get what in the physical sciences uh, are called laws, right? And so for Whitehead, a physical law, um, you know, say the, the laws of, um, particle physics are really established by uh, the collective decisions, not conscious decisions, but decisions nonetheless of the actual entities making up protons and neutrons and electrons and so forth, that these are real beings who have made decisions in the course of the history of the universe so as to establish a certain set of canalized behaviors, a certain set of habits, right? And these Behaviors are habitual enough that we can um, mathematize them, at least within certain limit conditions and so on, right? So this notion of society goes all the way down, and just like human societies have certain customs and indeed laws that govern our behavior, um, this, this is analogous to what goes on throughout the natural world uh, if we take Whitehead's scheme seriously. So Stengers will be returning to Whitehead's comment that the philosopher is attempting to weld imagination and common sense. So she's drawing on Whitehead here to seek this balance between, um, you know, the importance of not doing harm to common sense while also remaining open always to the shock that can be, be produced by new thoughts, by, you know, the power of imagination to conceive of alternatives. Um, so we, we need to hold this tension, right, between what everyone takes for granted as common sense and what science or metaphysics or art or other forms of culture creation um, can elicit in the form of uh, alternatives and disturbances to what we all take for granted, right? So there's a need to balance these two. Stengers also discusses the science wars uh, which continue to be relevant today as part of our sort of post-truth, post-fact situation. But they really, these science wars got started in the 90s and Latour and Stengers were certainly involved. And she talks about this refrain from physicists uh, where they, they would often tell the social constructionists, the critics of, of science and the, the way that it's imposing its facts on uh, society and so on. They'd say, uh, well, if you don't believe in the laws of physics, why don't you jump out the window? Uh, as if we needed Newton's uh, universal law of gravity or, or Einstein's 
uh, uh, understanding of, of gravity in terms of the equations of physics to know that jumping out a window would be a bad idea, um, right? And so, you know, Stenger says she's just so tired of hearing this rhetoric because it's really belittling, right, to everyday people to hear from uh, physicists in this way, as if we had no common sense, as if nobody knew uh, that jumping out a window would cause them to fall to the ground before science came along and defined gravity for us. It's important to remember that even within physics, as Whitehead um, provides an example, there are many alternatives, alternative theories of gravity to Einstein's. And the fact that Einstein's happened to win has more to do with the way that he captured the interest of physicists at a certain moment in history. Whitehead developed his own alternative uh, to Einstein's theory of gravitation, his general theory of relativity, uh, in 1922 in his book, Principle of Relativity. And um, it was thought to be empirically equivalent. In other words, it makes all the same predictions as Einstein's equations, and some argue it's that's still the case. And so you're left wondering, why has physics chosen one theory over another? The data available uh, is, is not... Um, sufficient to allow us to decide between these various theories of, of gravity. Indeed, there are something like 40 different viable theories of gravitation, uh, but you don't hear much about that because the physics community has sort of uh, centered around and had its interest captured by the fame of Albert Einstein and his particular rendering of uh, the general theory of relativity. So let me say a few words also now about Whitehead's modes of thought, the first uh, three chapters. Whitehead tells us right in the preface what he's going to be focusing on here. And that's the difference between the, the more superficial elements of our experience and the, the deeper uh, elements he says that the variable elements in our experience tend to be clear and distinct. And so think here of our sensory experience, uh, our, our visual feelings. Um, we see the world sharply outlined with uh, clear separations and distinct objects and so on. And our visual experience is, is constantly changing, whether the objects in our environment are moving or we ourselves are moving. And, you know, most of our conscious attention is geared toward this clear and distinct uh, visual experience. But Whitehead wants to point our attention to what remains dim and vague in the background of our conscious attention, because it's here that the necessities of our experience are lurking, right? Uh, those aspects of our experience which don't change, and so... Uh, are not noticed. And here, it's more our, our bodily feelings. Now, when our internal organ systems are working well, when we're healthy, we don't notice them at all, right? But they, the rest of our bodies, our physiology, um, these deeper dynamics of our nervous system, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic, all of this activity is going on in the background, we're just not aware of it. So it has a vague, indistinct, and sort of dim effect on what we, what we consciously attend to. But for Whitehead, doing metaphysics is an attempt to surface the invariable elements of our experience. All that's, that stuff that's in the background, typically, um, that we all know and, and experience, we just find it so common that we don't find the need to mention it. Metaphysics is, as Whitehead says elsewhere, the analysis of the obvious. Right? We're looking to uh, attend to those things which, because they never change or only rarely change, are not easily noticed. And so in these first three chapters, Whitehead's looking at these big ideas, importance, expression, understanding, and they're pretty basic, and for that reason, somewhat vague. And so you might find these chapters, uh, you might find it a bit 
almost tedious because he's talking about something that could seem obvious at first, but stay with it. I think he's trying to surface uh, something more important. <laughs> so he's seeking a general characterization of our experience, and he means experience um, across the board, right? Whether it's literary or artistic experience or uh, whether it is social or moral or political experience or whether it's scientific experience of the goings-on of the physical world. All of these special forms of experience uh, presuppose certain general characteristics and, and Whitehead seeking to articulate what those general characteristics are. And he tells us that in this effort, um, we're not in a position to be totally systematic here. Um, our premises are as yet uncertain, right? He says philosophy later uh, in this book, philosophy is the search for premises. Philosophy is not just deduction. Um, and so logic is a tool that philosophers can use, but it's not the master guiding the philosophical enterprise. And uh, he mentions Kurt Gödel here, uh, not by name, but you know, talking about this new development in logic only uh, six or seven years before he publishes this book, Modes of Thought, Kurt Gödel had developed his incompleteness theorems, which set certain limits on formal systems, um, including this this attempt to ground uh, arithmetic and logic that Whitehead was engaged in earlier in his career with Bertrand Russell in the Principia Mathematica. It turns out that a closed system um, produces statements that can't be proved by that system. Um, and could even generate statements that uh, are contradictory in the terms of that system. And so Whitehead wants to keep his system open, but he doesn't even you know, have the hubris to call his approach here system yet. He's approaching uh, the work of philosophy as what he calls assemblage. He's just trying to gather together those ideas in terms of which we can characterize our experience. And he wants these ideas to... Uh, have some coherence uh, to kind of require one another for their definitions, right? So he's coordinating uh, between our experience and these ideas in terms of which we can understand that experience. Now, in this first chapter, uh, he highlights importance and interest. And, you know, you could you could think of importance as akin to, like, value, uh, and he opposes it to fact, matter of fact. And these are opposites, he says, but they require one another, right? We don't know what is of importance or of value unless we contrast it with what is just there, what, what, is, what, is, what is just a matter of fact. So facts, you know, are um, there and we have to deal with them. Um, he gives the example of the earth rotating. There's nothing we can do about that right? It, it, the earth is going to do its thing, and we're subject to it. Um, but where does our freedom come in? Well, for Whitehead, we have the freedom to select among the facts, to highlight what is important, right? So we're free to emphasize, to take a perspective on matter of fact. Um, and in so doing, we are able to exert some um, influence, the influence of um, aesthetic selection or moral selection or indeed scientific selection and we exercise our freedom in this way. So he distinguishes between importance and interest. Um, importance, Whitehead wants to say, has more to do with the unity of the universe as a whole, whereas interest is a, is a sub- uh, a subset of importance that focuses more on the individuality of the details. And he points out here, as we've seen in Stenger's and also in Ekberg, scientists are not, strictly speaking, disinterested. Um, he says, zeal for truth presupposes interest, right? And so the scientific pursuit is interested in the truth, in taking us a perspective on facts uh, valuing facts for their own sake, for sure, but taking a theoretical perspective on fact so as to bring some, um, you know, 
deeper understanding uh, as regards how those facts relate to each other. And so, you know, yeah, science is interested in the truth. It finds truth important. And there are many other modes of importance, morality, logic, art, religion, and so on, in addition to science. And Whitehead wants us to pay due attention to all of these modes. He also discusses the myth of the finite fact, which came up in uh, Stenger's book. And he points out that this idea of a mere fact, of an isolated fact, is the triumph of abstractive intellect, right? Um, animals and, and young babies, they don't have a notion of mere fact, right? They certainly have a sense of interest and importance and value in their experience, but the idea of a fact uh, alone in the universe, isolated, uh, that could be examined, that doesn't arise uh, until you have a very um, complicated uh, conceptual network that allows you to, to, to distinguish uh, one finite fact from another finite fact, because the fact is, all facts are connected. They exist in a nexus of relations to one another, so each independent seemingly independent fact actually presupposes a background of many other facts stretching out to the edges of the universe. Now, Whitehead points to Plato and, and, and agrees with Plato that sometimes deep truths must be adumbrated by myth. And so the myth of the finite fact is actually really important. And as long as science recognizes the limits of the abstraction that isolates facts in this way, then it's perfectly uh, okay, and in fact necessary to think sometimes in terms of isolated facts. It's just that when science forgets that it's an abstractive exercise, um, then it be, it falls into exaggeration in its knowledge claims. Um, and so we have to keep in mind the sort of as-if status of finite facts, but finite knowledge is real. It's possible. Whitehead isn't dismissing this, right? And so in some sense, to call it a myth of a, the myth of the finite fact isn't to totally dismiss the idea. It's just to keep the limitations uh, in mind, because if when science fails to keep this limitation in mind, um, basically all of its statements are false. Whitehead says. So Whitehead also introduces this notion of perspective and feeling, and the way in which. Uh, feeling is this agent which reduces the universe to its perspective for fact. And how does it do that? It creates a gradation of relevance, of relevant importance. And so it's, it's our feelings which allow us to, uh, to take on a point of view on things which uh, renders mere fact into... Uh, something that is of value to us, uh, something that realizes a value. Uh, but it, it, you know, this perspective is always, um, well, there's, there's a plurality of perspectives, right? And you could say, well, what is matter of fact is just there. It doesn't matter uh, who takes a look at it. But because we each have our own perspective on fact, we sort of reorganize the facts and elicit uh, different features from the nexus of facts. And so this is why, for example, you could have multiple theories for the same uh, data set. There are different ways of uh, extracting importance based on our perspective. And for Whitehead, uh, feeling plays a very important role here, right? And we'll see how... Um, as we move into this next chapter on expression, Whitehead wants to point out the ways in which um, experience of importance and interest is always, we're, we're always compelled when we experience something important to express it, to communicate it. And he, he talks about this um, interplay between expression and feeling, and his word for feeling in his technical terminology is prehension. And so there's this kind of oscillation whereby we prehend or feel 
the importance of the world. We value the world by prehending it, and then we're driven to express what we have valued. And this movement of prehension, where we prehend or feel the world, uh, moves us inward into this sense of private enjoyment, but, but this private enjoyment then overcomes itself to become public expression, right? And all of process for Whitehead, whether we're talking about the process of human consciousness or of uh, the transmission of physical energy, goes through this oscillation from prehension to expression.